I'm here with Stacey. Lenore, thank you so, so much for being with me. Zach, it's a pleasure so far. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. It's going to continue to be a pleasure, I promise. Um, I'm going to give you a proper intro in the, I'll record it. That's fine. Can, uh, but I'll tell you that your work, can I, can I say that you started a movement, a free range kids movement? I mean, uh, I like it when people do. I'm not sure I deserve all the credit, but I'll take it. Sure. <laughs> Between, I mean, your work on that and your, um, I think that you took the helm or we're always at the helm of Let Grow. Yeah. It's called Let Grow. And I'll explain all of this in a minute or you can help me explain. Um, I'm a huge fan of your work. I think that in all of my work with kids, I work with kids who are, let's, for, let's call it behaviorally challenged, even though I mm -hmm. don't know that term, but that's how they're, people are brought to me with that kind of a label. And um, all of the work that I've done with them is inspired by trying to figure out, all right, what are your skills? What do you need to explore? How can I give you the room to explore it? Um, and how can I get other people off of my back so that I can continue to give you the room to explore it? Or how can I negotiate with other people so that they're okay with you um, exploring and knowing you're not gonna cause a fire or something. And so reading your book, it's sort of just like, um, I don't know, the roadmap for doing that in culture, not just in schools and not just with a specific type of person or person who's brought specific challenges. So can you talk a little bit about your background and what brought you into the work? I know you have a personal story. Um, you... Yeah, I'll tell you my personal story. I'm not sure what background I have that is significant. But anyway, so the, the, the Ur story is that when our younger son was nine years old, he started asking me and my husband in New York City uh, if we would take him someplace he'd never been before, and your word, explore, let him explore how to get home on his own, preferably by subway. And so we said yes. And one sunny Sunday, I took him to Bloomingdale's, which is not a place he'd been before. This is thrift. And, um, and sure enough, he had to go down in the subway, which is right under Bloomingdale's, this much I knew. Um, and he got the subway and he came down. He had to take a bus across town. When he got off the subway, he came into our apartment levitating with pride and excitement. And I didn't write about that immediately, even though I am a columnist by trade, because it was just a thing, you know, it was just something he did and I was happy for him. And so was he. But about a month and a half later, when I had no ideas for a column, <laughs> and I'd been talking to some of the other fourth grade moms who had thought like, wow, that's a little early to let your son ride the subway. Um, I said, well, maybe I'll write about that because it's, you know, it's like a free son of controversy between me and some moms. And my editor said, sure, go ahead and write it. It's a nice local story. I wrote it. And two days later, I was on the Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, and NPR, defending myself. And I started the blog that weekend calling it Free Range Kids to say, look, I like safety as much as anyone. I actually think I'm as nervous a mom as anyone. I wish I wasn't. Um, if we're going to talk about drugs later, maybe you can <laughs> prescribe one for me um, because there's certainly plenty that scares me, but not strangers and not public transportation and not New York City because I'm so familiar with them. I'm a, you know, I'm a reporter. I'm always on the subways and I'm always going around. And so were our kids because they were always with us and that's how we got around. So um, once I started the blog, then it grew into the book, Free Range Kids. And um, did it start a movement? I'm not sure, but it gave people a word for or a name for what they were thinking, feeling, and doing. Um, you know, not everybody, but a lot of parents out there were sick of this culture where you had to be with your kids every second and arrange every play date and, you know, comment on every picture they drew and whether they were using the ball right or wrong and what does the word fork begin with, begins with an app. I mean, they were just tired of this extremely over-involved. They were involved parents. They weren't laissez-faire parents. They were laissez-faire parents, but they weren't neglectful parents. Right. They trusted their kids with some independence and free range kids gave them a name for it. Now I'm hoping we call them, them let grow kids because about three or four years ago, um, I was approached by Jonathan Haidt, who you've probably read. He wrote The Coddling in American Mind. Absolutely. And Dan, yeah, fantastic genius. And uh, Dan Shuckman, who had been uh, the chairman of FIRE for 10 years, FIRE Fights for Free Speech on Campus. And they said, let's start a nonprofit together because we feel that kids by the time they're 18 or 19 seem unready for the world. They're, they're, e they're fragile, easily hurt, confused, mistaking, feeling uncomfortable for feeling unsafe. And I said, sure, we can start this so long as we also have Peter Gray on our team. Peter Gray is... Uh, a writer who's a psychologist, a professor of psychology at Boston College, 
evolutionary psychology, who has written about the importance of free time and free play. So the four of us together started Let Grow, and the only difference between Free Range Kids and Let Grow is A, now I have a real title, I'm the president of something, yay! Um, and B, Free Range Kids was me trying to spread an idea and, and a word, and, and you know that was pretty successful, but, but Let Grow is trying to change behavior because you can agree with everything I talk about and probably everything you talk about, but until you actually change your behavior, you just keep thinking, oh, that's a good idea, I'll try it someday, and nothing changes because the fear is still in place and the protections that you think are necessary are still in place, so you never have any input like that you can feel at a gut level that your kid is gonna be okay without you doing everything with them or for them. So the behavior that we really push is for parents to let their kids do something on their own, preferably outside the home, so the parents aren't with them. Literally, there's a wall between them <laughs> and their kids, and maybe there's even a block or two between them and the kids, because when the kids come home from this independent adventure exploring, they are so happy, and the parents are so proud. You know, they're, they're a little sheepish in some ways, like, why didn't I let them do that sooner? He's nine. My God, at nine, I was blah, blah, blah. But they are also so thrilled. And in their gut, they've replaced this feeling of, no, 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 he can't do it. I could never forgive myself something terrible, blah, 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 with, look at my kid. <laughs> this <laughs> is my Zachary. He went and he got the bread for dinner. This is the best bread we ever had. Tomorrow he's getting a peanut butter. He's going to make his own sandwich. And then everything changes. So you need to change your behavior before you can change your behavior. And Let Grow is dedicated to making it really easy and normal and legal to change your behavior and give your kids some independence. When you let your kid ride the subway, was that, I mean, was that, did that tug against your instincts? Did you rational, did you reason that, well, this would be a good independent strategy for independence, even though I feel nervous about it, we'll see what happens. Or were you, are you sort of an open-minded generally? I think you said you maybe are a little bit of a neurotic parent at some point. <laughs> yeah, we're all <laughs> neurotic parents. Um, and some of us are, you know, particularly neurotic about certain things. If we talk about, you know, should anybody ever be allowed to drive a car? No. Motorcycles? No. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> right, my right. son rides a skateboard. I can barely talk about it. So let's not. Um, but in terms of letting him ride the subway, the, the thing I I don't really remember, I mean, he's 23 now. So was I really nervous? I was happy when I saw him again. Uh, I, if I thought it was dangerous, literally dangerous, not just maybe a little confusing, I wouldn't have let him do it because I'm not pro-danger, right? I'm pro-independence, but danger is disgusting to me. I, what, I, what I'm so interested in, and the reason I can wake up now in my 14th year of the same topic and still think about it, is because every day I'm still trying to figure out all the permutations of how all of us who are parents today I would say 90% of us grew up pretty free range. You know, we either walked to school or to the store or to the soccer game or had some time alone when our, you know, with the latch key. And, and yet we're so afraid to let our kids do it. That, that's, that sort of interests me. What interests me no, more now is, I was actually doing a podcast yesterday or Monday, I can't remember. And uh, the, it was a husband and wife team talking to me and inevitably, we got to this one point, and I'm going to say it now so we don't get to, to it here. And I actually don't think I was going to get to it with you. But the question was, well, Lenore, even if the chances are one in a million, one in a zillion, one in a trillion, which is, I think, our budget right now, one in a trillion that some, you know, that my kid could get, you know, kidnapped or whatever uh, in the three blocks between here and school, I could never forgive myself, blah, 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 blah. What I'm trying to figure out now is that part of the equation, not just why do we go to the very darkest place. I think I've sort of figured out why, you know, it's the media, it's a litigious mindset, there's experts, there's so much advice. Okay, I get the way we've been sort of programmed to always think of the very worst case scenario, first mm -hmm. I call it worst first thinking. But it's that I would never forgive myself. It's, it's so interesting to me because he didn't say, wouldn't it be terrible if my child died? <laughs> it was, I would never forgive myself. The kid was almost a, not, not quite an afterthought, but it was really framed in terms of self-loathing. Yeah. I, I don't get that. And I'm trying to figure out where that 
where that framing came from, where that it's not even framing, it's something that people feel and they say so often that it's not coincidence, right? They're all thinking of it in terms of, okay, the bad thing, the worst thing happens, of course, should be, you know, my kid turns out, you know, it's going to be on a milk carton. And there's no, there's no grace. And, you know, I can understand, you're not feeling, oh, well, you know, these things happen, but there's just, you're, you're hating on yourself in advance. And the idea that you would give your kid any independence is seen through the lens of, how dare you, you loathsome person. It's just, it's not like, hmm, I wonder if this is safe. This seems like a good idea. I really want him to be independent. Maybe it's a little too soon. It's like, you viper, you devil, you hideous monster. Where does that come from? I'm going to make a parallel. I don't know if it's um, going to be exact in your world, but, or, or work super well. But, um, one of the things that I work with both and adults who have addiction problems on is the idea of trauma. And so, of course, that's a difficult balancing act because you have to have the humanity to acknowledge a person's experience and what they feel is traumatic and what they feel besets them and what they're worried about. Mm -hmm. I'm actually going to take notes, believe it or not, during this call. So if you hear a little typing in the background, that's just me trying to figure this thing out and typing what you're awesome. saying. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that's great. That makes me feel involved. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, the most, you know, the greatest gift you can, I, that I could give a client, I feel, is um, an expansion of that frame to not only what am I worried about or what has happened to me in the past, but first of all, how can I use the past experience to map on to now so that I can learn from it and maybe be safer or better or happier because of it? And also, what are the kinds of risks that I can take moving forward or how can I utilize my own skills to make my experience all the better? You know, looking forward prospective and optimistic rather than dwelling on some something traumatic and it sounds like there's something similar here where you're talking about you've experienced parents who once they give their kids a level of independence that maybe they were worried about in the first place that it's like their eyes were open to a new world of parenting where absolutely yeah themselves at the center of it and they're so happy elated they can share this experience with their kids and they're developing and you know they're taking on the world of, preparing them for the world in a new way yet mm -hmm. at the time so many people, obviously it's uh, sociologically interesting that so many people are hesitant to be the first ones or the only ones or ones at all to be able to allow their kids to take risks. And so their, their focus seems to be on the risks and seems to, it sounds like it's hard for people to center their focus on the, the ultimate rewards of allowing independence and what that means and what flourishing and you know, self-responsibility and being able to explore looks like. that. None of that was a question, but... Right, right, right. And actually, none of it <laughs> provides me a satisfactory answer. Alas, I was waiting, you know, for, there's a there's a New Yorker cartoon that um, it was the caption contest. It was like a week or two ago. And you see somebody climbing to the top of the mountain. Clearly, you see the guru and the guru is a goldfish in a goldfish bowl. <laughs> and, and one of the captions was, if, if I knew the answers, do you think I'd be in this bowl? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But did you think, it, is that a, at least an okay job of, you know, framing the issue? Yes. The yes. Um, here's, here's the problem. And then we're going to go forward from here because I think we are getting somewhere. Um, the problem is a risk versus reward equation. Because as my son once pointed out to me, as I was, older son, not the, not the subway writer, as I was saying like, wow, it's a, you know, 105 children are kidnapped by strangers a year and 10 of them are murdered, which is out of 70 million children under age 10 or whatever, you know, and I said, and that's a 0.00001% chance. And he said, mom, you've already lost because by the time you say one or you said 105 or 10 or stranger, <laughs> you know, people start picturing their child as the one. And the fact that you can't get to zero, even though statistically 0. 0.00001 is considered zero, but it isn't by humans, just by, you know, statisticians, that doesn't work. So even saying like, look at all this great independence you're gonna have, and you're gonna be inoculated for the future, and you're going to have the world as your oyster and insouciance and confidence and self-esteem and self-efficacy are yours, or, but you might die. <laughs> right, right. Loses. And so what I'm also curious about, and I don't know if it's separate from the I would never forgive myself issue, is the framing of everything as a trade-off 
I, I don't like it. I feel like there's this cost benefit analysis that we, us poor, absolutely abysmal statisticians, including me, um, put on everyday activities that we never did before. Mm. Now, well, if it's a one in 22,000 chances of having a concussion and all the people who get concussions, one tenth of 1% go on to have permanent brain damage. You know, like by the time I'm doing that, I'm sort of not thinking like, well, you know, generally soccer's safe, <laughs> you know, or right. I trust my kid <laughs> to play basketball, right? So there's this weird sort of, um, what's the word, a bureaucratic way of looking at things. There's, there's another word for that, where we're all statisticians in our minds. And I don't think you can keep going through life that way, but we mm. do it. You know, there's how many calories in this, how much, you know, this is all organic. And so it's 10% better for you. It's like, can we eat some food? Can we play some games? Can we walk outside without it being um, fed through the, you know, actiometer? Is this action worth what you are going to pay? It's like not everything is, there's not a pay for everything. There's not a downside to everything, but we seem to be thinking we can calculate that. You mentioned, well, you've mentioned many times, a lot of ideas. You hit on something here that there's like a litigious, you know, litigant inspired analysis that we do all the, but it's just not a healthy one. It's just you lose flow that way of life, and it don't. It almost sounds to me like parents are looking for permission to just be natural. Like at the same time as you're you're um, trying to help people understand that kids need to explore and play and become independent, parents seem to be looking for knowing that it's okay for other parents in culture that they're not going to be that's not going to be a spotlight on them for being the parent who allows their kid to explore and play and um right i think what we're, we're getting at is not just that it's allowed for them but you really need i mean what i'm trying to create and i don't know if i am is a community enough of a community feel that even if something bad quote unquote does happen you will feel um, loved and trusted and mourned with as opposed to vilified by the people who matter to you. And without a feeling of we're all in this together, boy, fate is fickle, you know, bad things happen to good people. I'm just reading that finally, when bad things happen to good people. Um, without a feeling that there is grace um, I'm sounding like a preacher. I'm a Jewish mom. I don't know why I'm talking about grace. But without that feeling, it's almost impossible to do anything because um, each step is a step potentially into the abyss. There was, um, there was one time in Vermont. I mean, it wasn't even in the county that I lived in. It was just in the state that I live in. Uh, a girl had wandered off of school property at one point, you might even know about this, and I might be, treated, so I'll just give the vague overview. And she wound up getting hit by a car. Hey, and when was this? At a school, 2015, 2014, maybe something. Okay, like. not, not so distant past. Okay. No, no, not, not too long ago. And so I remember working in a school district where the, the respective schools were building fences, you know, tr thinking about how to, they needed to respond. You know, they need right, to, right. There has to be a response, right? Right, and I wonder if the if our responses to bad things happening have something to do with attitudes around uh, willingness to let people explore, and or or the way that we calculate safety rather than just going ahead and doing an activity. I am very familiar with the response, and it's of um, if this happened to one child, if only we had done. X, Y, Z, it wouldn't have happened. So let's, it sort of sometimes feels like, um, you know, we're going to sacrifice a, a, a bull to the gods. We're going to mm -hmm. put, you know, 15 foot fences around every piece of school property. Sometimes I feel like, you know, if, a, if something horrible happens to a child and is on a Tuesday at 4 p.m., no children will be allowed out on Tuesdays between 3 and 7 p.m. anymore because if we had only had that law back then, and especially if you name the law after the child, it feels like it's consecration. And you do say, you know, like, God, if you bring my child back, I will never eat meat again. I will go to mass every week. I will, you know, give up all my worldly goods and climb up to that goldfish and leave him some 
flakes. Uh, so I, I, I think the response, you know, sometimes the response makes a lot of sense. If it turns out that your school is next to a highway and there's no fence and you can't really tell, you know, where the highway begins. I can't imagine this <laughs> happening where the highway begins and the school property ends. Yeah, put a fence there or, or a warning sign or a, you know, 10 mile an hour speed limit with speed cameras. But sometimes I, I think it's because we can't wrap our heads around the idea that bad things happen sometimes without people having been grossly negligent, without somebody making a really stupid decision, uh, without somebody being heedless. And, and there's something that has happened in modern society that says, if something bad happened, we sort of, we can't do the sacrifice to the gods and we can't say the Lord works in mysterious ways and we can't say fate, you know, there, but for the grace of God go I, it's all, well, let's make a new law and let's put up a fence and let's make sure no children do anything ever again. And if you do, you are courting disaster and, and we will hate you and you will get no sympathy. You will only get um, stoning from us. Exactly, exactly. So that's the distinction between, so you mentioned there could be common sense efforts if some tragedy has happened. Yeah, sometimes it's like you did something wrong. You know, it was like you should have had, you know, the, the swing set being 70 feet high was a bad idea. <laughs> you know, sometimes right, so the swing set is the normal height and a kid falls off and just because of fate, they hit their head the wrong way and it's horrible. In, what was it? In one part of, I can't remember the town in Washington. That did happen and they banned all swings and so did the district next to them. And you could see the impulse, but the chances of that happening again, because there was nothing wrong with the swing set and, and you know, it had been there for 50 years before and it will be, would have been there for another 50 years, but one tragedy equals somebody did something wrong and we will um, fix it with a lot more rules so that's the distinction between like a harm reduction approach where you say, all right, let's lower the speed limit or put a speed limit sign somewhere, which everyone gets to maintain their normal daily behavior, mm -hmm. way, except that we're going to use people who are drivers on the road have to use caution. And so that's that's it. That, that affects maybe drivers getting tickets, but it doesn't affect the ability for people to you know move freely across the town or lowering a swing set if it's 100 feet high or whatever. And, you know, even if even if it the swing set was fine and you needed something for optics and there was some legal reason you wanted to do it, making a change so the kids could still swing, but you could guarantee a safer experience. Well, that's an interesting word, guarantee. Because once we're into the world of guaranteeing, yeah, that was a horrible <laughs> then we are that. in the litigious world and we're in the, well, why don't we just take the swing set down? That way we can surely guarantee that nobody will ever be hurt. There's no way to right. guarantee absolute safety if anyone does anything, sometimes I try to That's flip true. it, flip it for people. And I say, okay, you don't have to let them walk to, to the store if you're afraid of them being abducted or hit by a car. But I hope you're not, you don't have any stairs in your house. You don't have stairs, right? Because, you know, and then I, you know, I quickly Google the statistics of children who die from falling downstairs and like no bathtub, right? Because there's drownings. And I hope there's not solid food in your house because, oh my God, the choking statistics, those are really scary. It's strange to me, we, we give people a pass on dangers that we haven't decided are untenable. Mm -hmm. There's something about joy, like you have to eat, you have to walk up and down the stairs, but a swing is joy. Walking outside on your own, riding your bike, these are joyful experiences. And you can, you can get a pass because your kid had to eat dinner, but they certainly didn't have to go on a swing. Right, right. No, you're really speaking my language. And so there's um, the alternative to what I was trying to say, which was, um, by the way, I was being, I was being the voice, I was playing the part of an administration who wants to say, we guarantee safety. Right. But the alternative to that, which I've experienced now in so many contexts, let's, talk, let's say in schools, is that you have a group of teachers, educators, people who work with kids who want to create really meaningful experiences. And sometimes- mm -hmm. And letting them create their own like mm -hmm. the teachers auspices but but you know they're playing and they're figuring things out mm -hmm. the no-no and i know that I'm, I'm not saying anything new to you you've literally written the book <laughs> that has that has downstream consequences of course that now you and i have written about that are 
terrible. I mean, they're really terrible if you have people who not only parents who are curious, worried, neurotic, scared, wondering, but people whose expertise is to give children a good and meaningful experience growing up, who know that it would be better to allow them to explore, but who feel stymied because of, you know, of all these rules. That seems not only counterintuitive, but that seems dark. To it me. is dark. Let me tell you, because I have such a terrible memory, I have to tell you the story I heard today, <laughs> because God knows what I heard yesterday. But in terms of whether we're creating or, you know, allowing to flourish the kids with the, the curiosity and the wherewithal and the can-do spirit and the confidence and, and uh, optimism is a good question um, because of the way we're raising them. And, and, and I never blame parents because this is a culture where even if you want your kid to walk home from school, sometimes the schools won't let them self-dismiss. Um, sure which sounds like a magic trick. Um, and there are, you know, there are places where you could get arrested for letting your kid, Virginia has several counties where you're not allowed to let your child who is under age nine be alone ever, including in your house, um, outside or in your yard. So it's a, um, it's a culture that completely discourages parents and teachers who believe in kids and want to give them more independence and find themselves stymied or second guest. And so, and you're warned all the time something terrible could happen. And I, I, I left my copy of Parents Magazine uh, somewhere yesterday and otherwise I would be flipping through it and reading you everything that they have in this month about things to be worried about when your kid goes back to school and they won't be able to handle it and go through a practice run dropping them off and open the door and make sure they understand. Everything is written as if your children are completely inert and in danger and stupid and you must be there for everything they do. Otherwise, they will fall apart and you will be at fault. So I don't blame parents because that's the message they're getting everywhere except from Zach Rhodes podcast. So um, today I was talking to a, a coach, I think one of the head coaches, from a children's soccer league called Steel Sports, S-T-E-E-L Sports. And about two years ago, I was talking to them, things take time. And it was me and Peter Gray. And we were saying, you know, it's really important to give kids some free play. I wonder if you could give kids a little free play. You have the kids three to four days a week after school. And on a Saturday, could you consider maybe a little free play? Maybe one day a week could just be them playing soccer. And what they ended up doing was a pilot project where they did, um, I don't know, a couple of leagues were doing about 10 to 15 minutes of free play before each practice, in, in, as part of each practice, like you got there. And then, um, and they saw it was so great. The kids were happier. They were more creative and competent that they um, expanded it to all their teams, which I consider a giant triumph because these are teams, this is the real world of children's sports and they're embracing free play. And so I heard all sorts of good stories, like including that the kids now run when they get dropped off to go to uh, the, the game because they know they're gonna have this precious time for free play and they're inventing new games. Like uh, they made, the, they put the, the goals together and now they have to toss the ball, you know, with their head like tennis over the nets and stuff, just really creative and they're getting better. He said, they're getting better at talking to each other and speaking up more because it's so spontaneous and they're more communicative. But what I really loved is that he said in the older kids, and these kids go up to 19. It's like before you go off to college. Uh, he thought like free play with older kids. So, so the 19 year olds, they would have just started when they were like 17 or 16 with this free play. And they came up with all sorts of games too. And he said, and what's interesting now is that in some of the, uh, the practices, the, the best kids on the team will not want to go in in the first, I don't remember what it's called. I know nothing about sports. There's the subs and there's the starters, right? They don't want to be the starters. Why not? Because they know they're good and they want to get a feel for how everybody's playing, their fellow teammates and watch. And they take on the role of coach for those 10 or 15 minutes when they have free play, they have assumed this leadership job out of love for the team out of recognition of their own skills, out of wanting the best for their fellow man, and out of knowing a lot, you know, and having great ideas. And when we're talking about what are we taking out of kids' lives, we want to create kids who feel that way, who feel like they're in control, they have something to offer, um, they've figured out a path 
to getting what they want and they're not jerks they're just they're just wise in their position in the world and so i bring that up because we were just talking about what happens if you don't give kids any of that. And I, all I can tell you is before they started doing this, you didn't have those good students or those good soccer players standing at the side going, wait a minute, I got this, I'm gonna coach. In my world, with uh, the idea of protecting kids indefinitely is disastrous. But And so sometimes I think people need a name for what happens when things go downhill or a bad path that way. Addiction happens to be something that I think, you know, when it comes to just rendering kids competent rather than, you know, being over their shoulders all the time and helping them be independent. I think that is the greatest bulwark against kids growing up to become involved with some sort of addiction, whether it's drugs or anything else, because they're figuring out a way of um, just achieving balance you know, overall, they don't need to, they don't need to cling to one experience that usurps all of the others um, because they have, they've explored the world. They have a variety of interests. They have, they understand how to communicate. They understand that there are going to be challenges and sometimes there are going to be challenges that can't be solved for them. They might either have to solve themselves or they might have to think about what the resources are or go to their own, you know, look inside and think about their own best skills. So when I say to people, so when I talk to parents about um, who are really worried about addiction, so they think about addiction as something that just happens. So it could be to mm -hmm. anyone, who knows, it could happen to my kid. When I talk in those terms and, and talk about how just sort of letting people be independent and learn and explore on their own um, turns them into some sort of addiction-proof, so to speak, person, that really helps them. They feel like there's a there's some mysterious force that's just uh, been able to be reckoned with because they that's something they can do. So do you feel like naming, having a name for some of the ills of um, being helicopter parents, let's say, or teachers or a community has helped people sort of look in the other direction? Or if not, I guess, what are some strategies to help people start thinking that way? Yeah. Um... It's weird because the minute we talk about helicopter parents, everyone, including me, um, feels defensive. Nobody thinks yes. that they are a helicopter parent or wants to be one. And I, I also can't um, attest to, boy, if your kid is free range from age five on up and you embrace the let grow philosophy, um, your kid will be a leader. They'll be on the side <laughs> teaching their fellow soccer players how to kick that goal and they will never be addicted and they will get straight A's. I mean... Let you me know, tell you that I would never say that about an individual either, but just, you know, a trend culturally. A trend culturally. Well, um, interestingly, I, I actually am curious because I, the, the little I know, which is like zero about yeah. addiction and stuff, but I do remember reading statistics that show that actually kids growing up in this generation are like have better relationships with their parents, you know, less contentious, I think, because they're one of the same, and, um, and also less addiction, I mean, and, and also less teen pregnancies. I think that there are some positive uh, trends. They're not just all the, uh, the things I focus on, which are the anxiety and the depression, which I'm sure would be more likely also to lead to, to some problems. But what, what do we say about the, the statistics? Well, it depends about how you frame the statistics. So if, if we're thinking about addiction as just drugs and alcohol, mm -hmm. I mean, there's kids are using, as they're growing up, using fewer drugs, using less drugs, using less alcohol. Okay. If addiction is an overall experience where you are, um, that means you have, you're hyper-focused on something to give you some sort of elation or relief from something else or seclusion or something like that. Mm. You And you rely on that as mm -hmm. the sole way of achieving that sort of state of mind yeah and you feel there are no other attractive alternatives that's how yeah. I, that's how i or how stanton would define addiction um mm -hmm. then it doesn't seem like we're going in a great direction i mean that's so, interesting okay we'll, yeah. we'll align that with things like depression or um life satisfaction let's say where we're us is really i mean we're at the bottom yeah uh, world statistics so that's so i open up a definition to, to that end and I, I, I would argue that 
being able to prepare kids for life that they're, you know, the world that they're going to live in is, is going to be a boon one way or another. And no, I, I totally agree with that. I'm, so I'm interested, you know, where, what I'm talking about is generally lower down the pike, which is giving kids the, you know, the opportunity to, to ride their bike somewhere, to fall off their bike and get back on and realize like, okay, I can do this without anybody else around. And, yeah. you know, the, the high that comes from figuring your way out of a problem or, or making something happen. I, you know, that's all Let Grow is dedicated to. And I'll tell you the two Let Grow programs in a second, two school initiatives. Um, what was I going to say though? Um, older on, one of my current concerns is there is this big wide world out there. And not only are we not letting kids walk to the store or <laughs> climb a tree, I, I am upset that there is so little interaction between kids and the real world that they almost, uh, even graduating college, know very little about what's out there that they might be good at, that they might love and be satisfied by and succeed at. And, you know, in my family, we have two writers, like, God forbid, you're not going to be a writer when you grow up. You don't know a whole lot of other alternatives. There's, let's see, there's writing and there's blogging, <laughs> you know, oh, I guess you yes. can make little films. I mean, it's all about communications and, uh, you know, maybe you know what your neighbor does and maybe you have a couple summer jobs where you mow lawns or you work in the restaurant, but I'm, I'm so, you know, I guess because I have older kids, I'm very upset by the, the bell jar that is uh, childhood and early adulthood is there's so little um, way of finding out about the world. Exactly. So, I mean, I think that that might help too. I mean, you're talking about if the only alternatives are you know, addiction or seclusion, because you don't know where you fit in or where you might enjoy yourself or what you might be good at. How do young people find that out? I mean, I'm really curious. That's like my next thing. I want to figure out how kids from, I would guess, you know, 14 to 24 see something other than what their parents and their neighbor do. It's a good, it's a great question to be raised. I mean, I, I work at an elementary school level now. I did work at a high school and the kid I was tasked to work with at a high school came from places where anything they were teaching in school had nothing to do with what they were interested in. I mean, what goes on in life, what they need to do, people working two jobs to support their own parents or things like that. In a way, it was funny. They were the ones prepared for the world, if not for kind of some of the stories that are being told at school about themselves, like, you know, that had all these labels or deficits or mm -hmm. that they're being um, counterproductive because they're not good at a math class. But in a way, my job, you know, the idea was my job was supposed to be helping them do better in school. Uh, what my job turned out to be was harnessing what they already understood about the world, each other, and helping them grow resources both within the school and outside and kind of see the bigger picture. And so I would, you know, talk to people about their goals for the future, talk about different options, talk about their own skills and what you can use those skills to do. And their, their idea about what life would look like after graduation, even though sometimes it would be uh, glib at first, was it was very easy to reach these kids is all I'm saying. Really? Um, yeah, it was. Because I think this is actually really sad too. And so when I would have kids do a project for me, so there was a kid that was deemed, the word wasn't illiterate, but he was dyslexic, didn't write. I was instructed not to have him write ever in a civics class that I was teaching. And um, because he just couldn't handle it. This, we've tried this with him. Just one thing I'll tell you is don't have him write, mm -hmm. but draw amazingly. And actually he could write. He just, it was painful for him to write pages of, of notes. So in this civics class, I taught him about political cartoons. Oh, and wow. So he started drawing them and he would draw the concept that we were talking about. And he had this very deep understanding of satire. I mean, he really could draw an ironic or, you know, hilarious political cartoon. And then I would have him just uh, caption it. And then we put it together in a book. So he made this kind of political cartoon comic book. And I tasked everyone else in the class with writing different sections of this. And he decided to write different sections about what the cartoon was about. So actually he 
by just allowing him to kind of do what he was great at and give him a little bit of context, he chose to go above and beyond. And he actually published, I mean, it's bound and he has copies of his own book that he wrote, Andrew. So not only did he write, but he did double tasks because he just- That's so cool. So I think that sometimes um, kids with a, a tough outlook in, in a bizarre way, I'm not saying that I would recommend this. I wouldn't say, uh, you know, you should, you should make sure your kids have a rough life. And then they'll, they'll mm-hmm. I just thought that was telling that that sort of a population were the kids that I could reach a little bit easier in terms of what does life look like beyond these walls than kids who are um, trained to sort of think about a particular lifestyle, you know, a way that their life might look or, or, um, or bumpers that they had on because their parents took care of things. And, um, you know, you'll figure out about stuff in college or something. Mm-hmm, or, mm-hmm. You'll become a doctor. Um, right. Well, also, if you are looking forward to college, you have sort of four years of what might look like breathing room, right? Yeah. As opposed to having to figure it out smack dab now. Interesting. Okay. So, um, I think we both agree that, first of all, children contain multitudes. There are so many things that might turn them on. Often, most of them are considered a waste of time, or they might not even discover them if they're always in structured activities. And in fact, even in a structured activity like the soccer program I was talking about, giving kids just a little freedom already bore fruit of kids rising to, you know, become different and more successful, not because they're going to win a trophy, but more successful as people because they figured out something that they can do and they feel great about it and they're excited and they're not just um, a pawn. So we agree that more freedom makes sense, more trust in kids makes sense, less um, focusing on the downside of any potential freedom and more trying to, I don't want to say recalibrate because then we're back to numbers again, just trying to remember that we live in very safe times and to see everything through the lens of danger is, it, it's just, um, it, it's inconsistent with reality in that, you know, 200 years ago, if you fell off a horse and you broke your wrist, you would die because it, you could never get it fixed and you would get gangrene or whatever you get, or it would become infected, or you would be lame forever and there were no wheelchairs. I mean, it just, everything was so much more dire back then. And yet we seem to, you know, to write the simplest thing, and, and by simple, I mean walking two blocks in the suburbs as dire, as, as dire as being in downtown Kabul today, uh, or Kabul. Uh, today. So um, we agree. I think we both agree that the only way to change parents and schools is to, uh, is to almost push them into seeing for themselves and feeling for themselves reality, which is your kid can do that. Your kid feels great. You feel great. Wasn't that big a deal, you know, for them to do it, but it is a big deal in that it's a milestone, just like it's not that big a deal. Most kids will go from crawling to walking, but it's a big deal for you. And you don't ask them, okay, now go back to crawling. It's safer. You have four points on the ground. You know, let's just keep doing it that way just until 20 or so. Nobody does that. So, uh, and, and the, the, I mean, I was just back in the city the other day and I passed, I'm not normally in my old neighborhood and I passed the, the park where my first, uh, my oldest son had learned how to walk. And it's like, look, nobody cares. I'm like, look, there's, who cares? That's the park. Um, so, so we have to give those experiences back to kids and back to parents. Uh, Let Grow does it two ways. Um, our, our initiatives, our school initiatives are free. So it will sound like an infomercial, this next little part, but remember, there's no cost. Um, so one is the Let Grow project, where we encourage schools and, and also uh, you know, YMCA's and churches and police athletic leagues and after school programs, anybody can do this, which is to give kids the assignment to go home and do something new on your own without your parent. And we have a whole list of ideas. Actually, I want to add another. I just got a list of another 250 ideas, but it is everything from, you know, climb a tree, run an errand, ride your bike, make dinner, whatever. And um, because you're discussing this with your parent, it's not like you're in a neighborhood where you can't cross the street or where there are drug gangs at the park. You know, you can you you tailor it to you, 
your age, your parents, and your parents agree to it. But the parents agree to it because the school is saying to do it, right? And because all the other parents in that school are also doing it. So some of that blame, I could never forgive myself. It's like, well, we're supposed to do this. The teacher says it's really good. I'm reading this letter that Lech Rowe wrote that says it's great developmentally, blah, 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 uh, endorsed by Zach Rhodes. Um, and so they do it. And then you have this contagion of the best sort, which is like, what did your kid do? Oh, mine went to ice cream. Well, maybe mine will go with yours. Oh, my, yours went that far? Yeah. And then the kids are saying, what did you do? I made a raft. How do you make a raft? Blah, blah, blah. And the teachers, I mean, the sort of ancillary great effect is that the teachers see those kids like you did, the kid who's dyslexic, the kid who is, you know, the class clown, the one who's really slow at math or whatever. But he's the one who made a tree tire, you know, tree swing, or she's the one who went to visit her grandma and helped her on with her compression stockings. You know, you just hear about kids outside of school having other talents, interests, and, and competencies that you had no idea of before. So the kids see each other differently. The teachers see the kids differently. The kids come bounding up the stairs, say, guess what I did? You know, I made my first tortilla. And actually, in a, speaking of tortilla, in a school where there were a lot of Spanish-speaking parents who couldn't communicate with the school, and vice versa, they would text a photo. Look, here's my daughter painting the door. Here's my mm. son learning how to ride a bike. And so then there was more communication that way. So there's no downside. And like I said, it's free. You can do it instead of homework. You can do it um, as an alternative to homework. You can do it um, as, a, you know, just if you feel like doing it, do it, which is how one of the teachers did. And then all the kids started getting jealous of the other kids doing neat things. And it just sort of took off that way. So I would highly recommend anyone with a kid in school or anyone who's a teacher or an administrator, I guess we call them educators now, anyone who's an educator, to please go to letgrow, L-E-T-G-R-O-W dot org, and I'm sure it'll be in your show notes, and you look up school programs, and one of them is the Let Grow Project, okay? Uh, end of commercial for that. Other one we're doing is the Let Grow Play Club. Schools stay open before or after school for free play. And by free play, I mean... All the ages are mixed together. They're not on their devices. There's a bunch of junk out there. There's everything from jump ropes and balls to suitcases and old tires and a typewriter, whatever you got, something from the attic, something from the garbage can, bring it over. And the kids just figure out what they want to do and they solve their own problems, including that was mine first, that was my first teacher. It's like, thank you for letting me know. I'm sure you can figure it out. Thank you for letting me know. And the only rules are you can't deliberately hurt someone and you can't leave without telling um, an adult that you're leaving. So there's an adult there, but they're not organizing the games. They're not solving the spats. And, we, you know, just like you just heard me, I won't keep going on and on about that soccer team. But just like that, we, we at schools, the teachers see a new side of the kids. The kids develop new friendships, which might sound minor, but if you hate going to school and now you have a friend and you didn't have friends in your year because you have a list for your too big for the other kids or you're slower, but you become friends with kid two grades down from you or maybe two grades up because you're so cerebral and finally, you know, a fifth grader is paying attention to you. Mm. That changes your entire school experience. I mean, possibly yeah. changes your whole life. So, and we've seen that. We've seen kids who had no friends make friends and it breaks down barriers. You have the, this, this quote unquote special ed kids together and, you know, well, he might do really bad at one thing, but she sure is fun to play four square with or jump rope. So there's just... It's just win, 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 win. And it's not free because you do have to pay some adult to be out there, but it can be a high school student. It doesn't have to be, you know, a PhD in educative theory. It could be, you know, a, a local 17 year old. And um, we've just heard a lot of great things. There have been a couple of studies done about the play clubs who found the kids are more, at first they are still going to the teacher, asking the teacher to solve the problem, but then they stopped doing that because they realized doesn't get them anywhere. And then you just see them being creative and people are worried about bullying. And generally when there's mixed ages, kids are less bullying because there's something about the presence of little kids that makes older kids nicer. So, um, you know, we've seen it at title one schools, which are high poverty schools, as well as um, middle-class schools. And it, it seems to work like magic, but I actually think it works like mother nature because there's this drive to play in kids. And even kids who are unfamiliar with free play, there'll be some kids who know how to do a couple things. They know how to double dutch or they know how to organize a basketball game and then pretty soon everybody's involved. You may have touched on this somewhere sometime, um, but do you feel like there's part of this is that the same kids could be seeing each other every day within the walls of school, 
but maybe their experience is not as authentic with each other as it is when they're playing freely. Um, I think they're not having as much fun because they have to sit down and be quiet and pay attention and do certain assignments. And so really uh, the mixed age thing is really crucial because then at least you aren't with the kids that you see every day. If you've been decided, I remember, I can tell you from my kindergarten class, you know, who was Miss Perfect and who was the pariah? And I'll just give you their first names. Miss Perfect was Barbara and pariah was Linda. Um, and <laughs> I hope they're not listening. Right here. No. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody knows it. It's like you could be wearing signs around your neck practically. But I don't think that the fifth graders knew who was the pariah in kindergarten, my kindergarten class. And if she was willing to be the baby and they wanted to play house, well, then that's a, that's a very different day for her. And is it more authentic? I think it's more, it's a, it's a broader sense of who they are because they're not just the yeah. kid who's bad at math or the kid who raises his hand on every question and you can't stand him. Right. Okay. So you're experiencing. That's probably me. <laughs> well, yeah, me too. Experiencing whole the people or multi dimensions of other people that you might, you know. Experience. And you're making something fun happen. I mean, you know, you're playing a game or you're drawing or uh, trade. We used to do a lot of trading of cards. Uh, so you're not doing something that you're forced to do that you may or may not be interested in. It's something that you by, by definition are interested in because you got to choose what you wanted to do. I think really existentially, and I'm often reined in to try to make sure that I can apply it practically or talk about it practically. So practically speaking, if currently we have, um, there's reinforcement for being safe instead of, what would you say? Uh, allow, I, would, I wouldn't say. <laughs> allow an independence, then, then the alternative that you're providing is a positive reinforcement for uh, nurturing independence as opposed to only, you know, relying on safety. Right. I'm, I, it's not just positive reinforcement. What we, you know, the play club and the project, like we're a play club, like we're a project, are pretty simple. Um, but they are distillations of everything I've been thinking about and with John Hyde and with Peter Gray and with Dan Shuckman and a bunch of other people. Something that makes it um, easy, practical, inexpensive, straightforward, easy to get buy-in. I mean, really, um, we have a bunch of different slogans for Let Grow, but one of them, I think I said earlier, is making it easy, normal, and legal. And the easy part is not just because it's easy for the teacher, because we give you how to do it, and the letter to send home to parents, and the list of activities, and a little leaf that you can Xerox and cut out, and then kids can write, this is what I did for my project, and you can put it on the wall. Uh, easy for the parents, because they have been pushed. Yeah. Right. It's really hard to say, OK, today's the day. I know I'll feel terrible. Of, you know, I would never forgive myself if but I'm nonetheless going to let my kid. That's a very hard leap to take. You're doing it by yourself. You don't know if it'll work. It might be crazy. But if everybody is doing it because it is the norm, that's the normal part. Easy because you're pushed. Right. Normal. Everybody's doing it. And legal. We are trying to change the laws and we are changed the laws um, in three states to the point where 38 million people are living in a let growth state where it is. It will never be mistaken for neglect if you let your kid have some independence. Yes, if you put them into, you know, obvious, egregious, statistically likely danger, that's neglect. That's bad. But if you say, look, my seven-year-old is old enough to walk to the post office, it's, you know, four blocks away, she knows how to cross the street safely, it's okay for my five-year-old to play in the lawn, I'm going to let my nine-year-old watch the six-year-old while I go to the grocery for half an hour. All that stuff cannot be mistaken for neglect in Oklahoma, Texas, and um, Utah at this point, and we're working at five more states for this coming Excellent. year. Yeah, so easy, normal, legal. That's what we're trying to do. And we really do try to make it so that you have a community too. Online, if you go to, if you're on Facebook, we have a Let Grow Facebook page, but we also have a, a group called Raising Independent Kids on Facebook. And that's where people ask questions. Yesterday, there was something about a two-year-old. I don't remember what it was, but like, I can't get my seven-year-old off the couch. I love this whole idea, but she won't budge. What should I do? Or my neighbors are threatening to call CPS if I let my kids play in the backyard. What should I do? It's just where people find that community that we were talking about earlier, somebody who will support you if you're making a decision that is a considered decision to give your kids just some old-fashioned independence. It's you know, people need support, you know, me too. I mean, I'm happy to be on a podcast because I feel like it's affirming. Do you think that um, 
I feel free to reject this dichotomy, but I reject it. No. You probably do. I'm just, I'm going to put it out there so that we can swat at it, but okay. do you think it's better to make a gradual cultural, just um, a, adopting or like readopting of things we want to really naturally do for our kids or to have, well, like, so you mentioned you have an activity before or after school um, and that's the time that people know they can do free play. So the former, or is it, I guess, is there any downside to having this experience be novel? Like, all right, we're going to go about our lives, but then there's a novel uh, two-hour experience where we do it the let grow way. Um, well, when you do, when you first let your kids have some independence doing something, you know, the, the, the let grow project is doing something new that you haven't done before on your own without your yeah. parents. So that is, um, by definition, novel. There was an interesting conversation I had with a psychologist because, um, I got frustrated because some of the Let Grow projects I was reading about were, I thought, very minor and not life-changing. You know, folding towels, setting the table. Uh, these didn't strike me as anything that could possibly move the needle. Um, but but um, one of the people I was working with said, no, 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 you know, we baby stepped our way into this. We have to baby step our way out. So when I was speaking with the psychologist, um, he was of two minds. On the one hand, Exposure therapy is generally like, I'm afraid of dogs. Okay, well, let's, today we're going to look through pictures of dogs. You know, and the next week we're going to see a dog across the street. And then the week after that, you're going to be on the same sidewalk as the dog. And the week after that, you're going to pet the dog. So that's exposure therapy and that works. He said, but it is possible that I'm terribly afraid of dogs. And then, you know, the psychiatrist says, well, okay. But, and then he opens the door and in comes this adorable little puppy and <laughs> you're scared, but then the puppy is licking you and you're playing with it. And the, the distance between your fear and the experience is so great that everything gets rewired because you haven't been going along this path. Like I'm kind of scared. I'm a little less scared. I'm a little less scared. I'm a little less scared. It's like, I'm terrified. Oh wait, this is great. So I'm not sure whether novelty, like the, the sudden recognition of like, this is so fun. I was so afraid to go outside and I ended up riding my bike around for three hours this afternoon. If that's good, or if like today I'm gonna ride to the end of the block and then next week my mom says I can go around the corner and back, but she's gonna stand at the corner. I'm not sure. I'm not sure which is the better one. I, I Actually, if you know, you should tell me. No, I don't know. I don't oh. know. And I, and I suppose like um, having an a la carte is probably a good thing, you know. Let, let well, until we figure it out. I mean, yeah. maybe we will. I Actually, speaking of which, uh, whoever your listeners are out there, hello. First of all, thank you for listening. And, and really thank you if you do any of these things. If you decide to, you know, have your school do the Lecro project, or if we have... We do have the at-home version. <laughs> Sounds like a game show. Um, uh, <laughs> called the Lecro Independence Kit, also free. Uh, if you do that, I mean, all I want is stories. I want stories that will eventually lead me to data, but right now, stories of what your kid did, how it went, how you felt, what changed, what surprised you. Um, actually, I realized just talking to you, we should have a um, an evaluation form available on our site, come to think of it, right? What would that look like? Uh, exactly what I said. What did your kid do? Um, how, you know, how would you describe it? How would they describe it? Um, what went I wrong? See. What went right? You Those know, things in, in Yeah, the, what surprised you and what are they doing next or what are you allowing next? Yeah, evaluation sheet for parents on site there. Good. I appreciate you donating an hour of your time. I can imagine that you're busy. And um, uh, Busy and then also like, oh, yay, I get to talk to someone. You know, you know I'm mostly at home just writing. And so this is my fun. <laughs> so thanks. I feel that way too. Yeah, I yeah. get to talk to somebody. Um, thank you so much. Thanks for the work that you do. And I, I, my my goal was not to make this, um, you know, a conversation that you've had a trillion times. Hopefully, it's not too much. Of no, what? Look, I gotta. I can't. You know, here you're talking to me. Thirteen years, same story. And I, how come I never yeah. put an evaluation sheet? I was just talking with a friend this morning about how people have to sort of remember what the what the reason for the project was because they right. could end up doing the project. Oh, I'm going to have my kids do all sorts of chores. And pretty soon it is all about setting the table and making your bed. And there's the independence of being a contributing member of the family, which I do think is important, but it doesn't 
rewire the idea that letting my kid go out in the world um, will inevitably be disastrous with like, oh my God, now I'm so proud. I have a two-year-old. So whenever that evaluation goes up, I'm looking forward to filling it out and giving it to you. Okay, I'll two years old, I, uh, for the record, uh, they need a lot of supervision. It's not helicopter parenting to be with them. It's actually four or five years old. She's on the subway right now. No. Yeah, really. Um, <laughs> I, th I would trust a two-year-old on the subway because I think everybody would be very kind. Um, That's true. <laughs> but age four or five is when there's enough, um, uh, whatever it is, basic wiring, child development, that they can start um, doing things, walking to school, being with friends without you there. Uh, I realize that sounds really young, even sounds young to me, even though I walked to school at age five. So I remember it was in, within my lifetime. We were all trusted to do that, um, but not to. Yeah, of course, too, th that's an okay age to be doing tasks um, and pin. Well, l let me just say before I let you go, uh, but let me just say that I think that early ed seems to have it right. Like early ed is sort of naturally by that, I mean, like zero to three preschool, whatever, mm -hmm. seems to be very naturally play-based because what else, you know? You right. No, the best ones are what, you know, what you don't want to get caught up in is the idea that, wow, if my kid starts reading at three, she'll be right. two years ahead of everyone for the rest of her life. It doesn't exactly. work that way. So there's no advantage to pushing the academics before they're interested in that because the, um, you know, the little advantage you might think that you have, because my kid's already reading, blah, 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 it, it evaporates. And in the meantime, they could have been getting so much out of what we're just talking about, the playing. Absolutely. And that seems like to never end. You could scale it up and the idea that you're going to hit some bench academic benchmark is... Uh, uh, the idea that I'm three years ahead of anybody else who's exactly my age who didn't read until seven doesn't right. hold a lot, a lot of water, right? Um, anything else? Um, your more recent articles that I've read of you are at Reason. Yeah, I read a lot at Reason. Um, I have a syndicated column that most of the readers I hear from are in Iowa. <laughs> so if you're in Iowa, if you're in Cedar Rapids, right on. I love your newspaper. <laughs> yeah, you got to hold a party out there. Keep running it. <laughs> um, and then I write, I blog it like pro. So it's there too. Well, thank you so much for your time. Oh, this was fun, Zach, and interesting and actually very helpful for me. So thank you.